What in the world am I going to talk to you all about today? It ought to be in the Bible, though, shouldn't it? This is a Bible church. We believe the Bible. And I uh, have a little booklet in there in my office. It's called Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. I was always going to write a book called A Son in the Hands of an Angry Dad. That would be more fitting for me. But I read the book. And it was a great sermon that was preached for a couple hundred years by all kinds of people everywhere because of a man who preached it. And... Uh, when I read it, I thought it would have been great if it had just put the gospel in it. It told how wicked people are. And we are. I know we're not as wicked as we think we are, or maybe we are more wicked. I preached a sermon not long ago on my sin's better than your sin. It didn't go over too good. <clears throat> but do you know... I like the sermon also, Sinners in the Hands of a Loving God. You know, both of them are true. Sinners in the hands of an angry God. And the Bible says that God is angry with the wicked every day. But we don't always see what we do as that bad. So God should not be that mad. But he is. And because of his hatred for sin... As we've said before, God will not allow sin in his presence. He kicked the devil out. Kicked Adam and Eve out of the gardens if it just one. Tells us that we can't go to heaven unless we're perfect. That eliminates the whole human race. Nobody's good enough. Nobody's good enough. So the Bible says there's a place made for the devil and his angels. A place called the lake of fire. So God is going to take and send all the people that do not believe in him to a lake of fire to be punished forever and ever and ever. Isn't that horrible? How can that demonstrate the love of God? Before I get into my message, I wanted Jesse to come up here and give us a report on what went on and then last night also the banquet. Good morning, everyone. How are we doing? Good. Um, <clears throat> I just wanted to give you guys an update. How many of you guys were here for the banquet? Raise your hand if you were here. Uh, did anybody get ill? No? Okay, good. Because I heard the food was, was great. Did you all have a good time? Okay, I'm glad. I wanted to let you know that it was, it was a, a huge success um, on two levels, but uh, before I get into that, I want to. There are some people that I need to thank because their time and their hard work was really why this banquet went off uh, so well. The Lord did so many things through them, and I want to thank uh, Steve Pasternak, Ryan Pasternak, Tracy Martin, Jan Velasquez, Betty Arnold, Joyce Thompson, Betty Dowdy, Jonathan Adkins, Tyler Hamby, Lucia Velasquez, Nancy Polson, Justin Fields, Joshua Ross. My wife, Kyla Martinez, Peter Amato, and Louis Hernandez. I want a, a big round of applause for those guys. They did an awesome job. Each one of them did something different that was, that was very important for us to get things done. If I, if I forgot your name, I'm so sorry. I am a fallen sinner. <laughs> um, I did want to let you know the, 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 the two places this event was so successful in was, number one, I feel 100% that all 20 of those teens there now feel they have a part in ranch. And we haven't gotten that yet. I got on the bus. Uh, you know, everything is, is, you know, I'm running around like a chicken with a head cut off. And I'm just trying to get things done. And the banquet's going. Everything's going kind of smooth. And then it's over. And we're all done. And I'm, everybody gets on the bus. And we're cleaning up. And I get on the bus. And the first thing the kids do, they're like, woo, yeah. They're like all cheering and yelling and screaming. They were pumped up. And I realized Wow, these kids see this as their youth group now. They own this. They, they see, hey, this is ours. And when you get them to recognize that, now you get to see friends coming out. 
hey, come to my youth group. Come see what we do. And we're going to be doing some renovations in the back building where we're going to expand a room and make a youth room. And it, it, a lot of things are coming down the pipeline. I want you guys to know your prayers are, are being answered. The last thing is, <laughs> I, I feel eyes in the back of my head. Um, we raised for camp $2,765 through this banquet. That is 15 scholarships. We had 11 donated. I've got 25 kids in the youth group, and we've got 26 scholarships. So just in one fundraiser, we're taking care of. So now we're trying to get Georgia. We're trying to get all the kids that are coming from Georgia. We're trying to get them on scholarships, too. So please continue to pray for this. Things are happening here. Thank you so much. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. What about last night? Oh, yes. Last night's Friday night soul winning, I had a report that they were about at least between 40 and 50 that trusted Christ. So along with the total from Friday night, uh, that would be 180 in two weeks that were led to the Lord. And we know that the, the fair has some, some, some difficult things going on there with security and whatnot, but we were still able to get gospel out. That's why I love going to the fair, because they can't tell you no. You're just witnessing. That's it. You're, you're not, not, not trying to push anything on anybody, and it, it was awesome. The, I saw kids grow. We see kids that are just going out there and being proactive with giving the gospel. So pray for the youth group, because that's what's going to be coming up next. Thank you so much. Turn in your Bible to the book of Luke, chapter 16. We know that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. And you don't need to be saved unless you need to be saved from something. From something. Well, there is a place, a literal place called hell. And Jesus spoke an awful lot about hell. And that's why I trusted Christ as my Savior. Because I did not want to go there. I did not want to go there. And so when my father-in-law explained that to me, and I realized for the first time in my life, I was 18 years old, I'm going there. That's where I'm going. I am on my way to hell. And it scared me. It bothered me. I stood at the front door of the house, and I cried. I literally cried. I I didn't go to church. I wasn't a religious kid. But I stood there with crocodile tears running down my face, and I sobbed like a baby. I'd never seen anybody get saved, so I didn't know what you did. All I knew is, if what he said is true, I'm going to hell. Now, I know today a lot of people say, well, you shouldn't talk about hell because it causes people mental anguish. It makes them uncomfortable. Uh, People don't like to talk about that. I've also found out that people don't like to talk about death, dying. And yet it's appointed unto every man once to die, and after this, the judgment. It's the Bible. Because today, you know, you've got to be politically correct and not say anything that bothers people. We don't want to offend anyone. Well, Jesus probably offended more people than any single person that's ever come into this world. He told the truth. And I want to tell you the truth. If you have not trusted Christ as your Savior, if you haven't, And if you don't, before you die, you will go there. You will go to hell. You will go to a literal fire-burning place for all eternity. And no, you will not get out. And a tear in your eye ain't going to change God's mind. How you live your life, how you live your life, going to church, paying your bills, doing all these good deeds, doesn't help at all. Has no value to it. Zero value. Listen to me. I want to tell you the truth. I don't want people to go to hell. That's the reason I serve the Lord, because I don't want people to go to hell. And life, for me, is running out. I know I don't have much time left, just numerically. When you've already lived 72 years, you know you don't have 72 left. Well, maybe I do. I want to read to you something. Because we have these kids that go out on Friday night soul winning. And we have reasons, motives. Why do you do what you do? And I got three of these from three of the college kids. And I, I want to just read it to you because I want you to know where they're coming from, what they're learning. This is their first year in college. This is from Justin Fields. Justin, are you here? Yeah, you're sitting right. Raise your hand. Raise your hand. There you go. 
It has been calculated that 1.8 people die every second. That means every minute an estimated 108 people die and go to spend eternity in one of two places. Either going to an eternally perfect and holy heaven or an eternal dreadful fire burning place known as hell. Many people choose not to believe in hell because they don't believe God would allow people to go to such a horrible place. Many people believe hell is just a state of unconsciousness where you don't know what is going on and you don't experience anything. Unfortunately, hell is completely real and it is not a state of unconsciousness. It is a literal place of torment where you have a complete understanding of what is going on. You are absolutely capable to feel and experience the agony that this place provides. This is proved in Luke 16, the story of the rich man and Lazarus. This is a story, not a parable, because it uses actual names. It says in verse 23, And in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torment. From this verse we can tell that the rich man could see and that he was not unconscious. The rich man also goes on to say in verse 24, Have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. The Greek word for torment is bozanizo. It literally means to torment, to be harassed, to torture. If you look at Matthew 10, 28, where it says, And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. The word destroy, translated in the Greek, is apolumai which means to render useless, given over to eternal misery. We have scripture to back all of this up and prove that hell really does exist. Now that we know this, shouldn't we strive to do everything in our power to tell others? God has provided us with the most glorious message in the entire world, the gospel. He has entrusted us to take his word and shed abroad his love to the lost. Hell should not be a subject rarely talked about or not often brought up. In fact, Jesus spoke more on hell than he did on heaven. In my opinion, he is warning us about that horrible place that is located in the center of the earth. We should always mention hell when talking to the lost and explain to them how the Bible describes it. Then explain God's love toward us by sending his only begotten son, Jesus Christ. He took death payment that we sinners owe and stood in our place. All he asks of us is to simply put our trust in him. And he gives us the free gift of everlasting life in heaven. Wouldn't it be a shame if we kept this truly amazing love story to ourselves? And he's only been here for six months, but I think they're catching the idea. And this is why they should, they go to ranch, and this is why they go Friday night soul on him. You see, if you don't have a real good vision of what the Bible describes as hell, you've lost one of the biggest motivating forces that can happen in your life. I, I was just told just um, a while ago by Tyler, Tyler, where's your head? Raise your hand. Stand up. Stand up. Turn around. Let everybody see you. <laughs> Justin's already big enough. He just, no, he just turned around and you can see him. Tyler's not as big. But Tyler came up to me before church this morning and he says, um, it was your girlfriend. She goes to another church several hours away from here. And he says, this big tall guy that's in his church, big fella, came up to her because evidently she must have said something about coming over to the banquet. Is that right? And mentioned my name Yankee, evidently. And this guy comes up to her and says, I know him. And his name was Lonnie Coxey. I led Lonnie Coxey to the Lord about almost 40 years ago. It was in the early 70s. This was back whenever I had led 
Jack Mathias and a bunch of other ones to the Lord that dare to share talks about Greg Steer and all of his meetings. So here's another guy that's almost 40 years ago when he came out and trusted Christ as his Savior. But I'm so glad that he came out those many years ago. I had kind of forgot about this, but about 20 years ago, I was taking some kids to a camp up there in Tennessee. And we had one little kid that went, and he was too young to go, but he got in there somehow. He wasn't supposed to be there, because I don't usually let little kids go to camp. But Shay sitting right here, he went. And 20 years ago, up there in Tennessee, he trusted Christ as Savior, one of our camps. Now, whether you believe it or not, I wouldn't do these things and go to camps if I did not believe in a hell. Believing this motivates me because I don't want people to go there. I'm glad they're going to heaven, but I don't want them to go to hell. And therefore, they can't go to heaven unless they can escape hell. And the only way to escape hell is through the only Savior there is, and that's Jesus Christ. I've said this before, that Jesus Christ, the Lord himself, he's more real to me than the clothes that I have on my back. But this subject of hell is just as real to me as Jesus Christ is to me. It's as real to me as heaven is to me. I believe it's real. And people don't make good soul winners that don't believe it. Because then you just tell a message and... That's your responsibility. But see, like Paul says, he says, I did not just give you the gospel, but I gave you my very soul. It's the way that I was among you. That when somebody knows that you really care, you really care, there'll be a thousands of churches that'll be meeting this morning and thousands of preachers be preaching from the pulpit and multitudes of people will be listening and most of the preachers will never tell those people about hell and never warn those people. But they'll make them feel good. And they'll sell them some little, you know, feel-good religion, a health and wealth philosophy, a motivational stirring sermon. And they'll go out those doors as lost as when they came in and never hear the truth that when you die, you're either going to heaven or hell. And the only way, the only way you can ever escape hell is by will you accept Christ and him alone is your only hope of going to heaven. But I want to read this too because these kids go so in on Friday nights. They went last night. They work together for camps. They come to school to listen and to learn. This is what Tyler wrote. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. The verse John 3, 16 tells us that there is two eternal destinies. There is heaven, and there is hell. There is one of the biggest reasons why I share the gospel with people. Over 150,000 people die per day. So many of them do not know where they are going when they die. The majority of them probably do not know the truth about what the Bible says about salvation. Only about 32% of the world's populations would call themselves Christians. From my experience from witnessing, more than half of the people who call themselves Christians have no idea how to get to heaven. And that is a scary thought. Jesus himself spoke more about hell than he did on heaven. Hell is a real place. The Bible tells us that in the book of Luke chapter 16, it is a true story. It's not a parable. About two people, a rich man and a poor man named Lazarus. The two men both died and Lazarus went to a place of comfort. The rich man went to a place of torment. In torment, the rich man still had his senses. He knew what was going on around him, and he was burning in a flame but not burning up. That rich man is still there today. Right this section, second, in a tremendous amount of pain, Matthew chapter 25 talks about the unbelievers at the end of the tribulation period. They are cast into an everlasting fire, which is the final hell where they will be forever and ever. That is what the Bible says. The word everlasting 
comes from the Greek word aeon, which translated eternal or everlasting, which means perpetual and without end. And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. This verse in Matthew chapter 25, verse 46, tells all about unbelievers and where they will go away into everlasting punishment, but the believers into life eternal. If someone does not believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross to pay for their sins, when they, then they will go to hell of everlasting fire and punishment. It hurts me to think about my loved ones going to hell while I'm in heaven. However, while I am happy and safe, they could be forever in pain, torment, and loneliness. It even hurts me to think about people that treat me bad. When we are witnessing that our Friday night soul winning, and someone blows me off or even cusses me out, I am not sad about them making fun of me. I am sad and upset because I know one day they will see that they could have just listened to me and heard the clear gospel of Christ and salvation and could have went to heaven. Instead, they rejected it and will have to suffer forever in hell. It honestly hurts me to think about that. They are going to have so much regret about that certain opportunity they had, and it will haunt them forever as they are burning. That motivates me a whole bunch to go and spread God's amazing gospel. If I have the chance to lead someone to the Lord or how Jew says, pulling them out of the fire, I'm going to take that opportunity and give that gospel the best I know how. So even a poor attempt is better than no attempt at all. But you wonder why these kids go? Because of something they believe. Do you really believe? You really believe there's a hell? That's kind of redundant to say that because why would you need someone to down the cross and pay for your sins to keep you from going to a place that don't exist? But if this is real and it does exist, you see why people need a savior? This is serious business. Our church here, for you that are visiting with us, this is not a game. It's a serious business. We don't want people to spend an eternity separated from God. Not when they could know they have eternal life and know they're going to heaven when they die. Let me just ask this. Everyone in this room, if you know right now positively, you know you're going to heaven when you die. I want you to raise your hand. Just raise your hand real quick. All right. Put your hand down. So if you saw all these people raise their hand, it's not because they're good. It's because they're sinners that have been saved. They simply believe that when Christ died, he died for them. Paid for their sins. And if he paid for their sins, see, you don't have to pay for yours. I don't have to pay for my sins. I committed them. I should. But I don't have to pay for them. Why? Because someone did it for me. Someone paid for my sins. And so I accepted Christ as my Savior. And I pray that you will. Jesse Martinez, you've seen him up here and putting all the things together for the ranch and you know, the sweetheart banquet and Friday night soul winning. He came up through this ministry. But he's the product of a lot of people because a lot of people have put effort into their lives. And so it's not one person. It's a whole bunch of people that influences somebody. And so he's been here and he dedicated his life to the Lord. And I think we are very privileged to have a person of his caliber in this ministry. He has really proven himself to be tremendous. But you need to know how he thinks. What goes on in the mind. Why do you do what you do? Why do you care? Why do you sacrifice? This is what he wrote. I only gave him a 99 for it. That's because he put an A in his letter and he shouldn't have done it. And you and I know nobody's perfect. Hell is a literal fire-burning torture chamber that lasts for all eternity. It is not a place of group confinement, but a place of solitary isolation. The Bible describes, describes hell as everlasting torment and eternal flames. There will be gnashing of teeth and the smoke of their burning will ascend for all, up for all eternity. 
There is no rest, only weariness. There will be no break in the punishment. Hell is not a place anyone would want to go. Hell is not fit for the worst crime or criminal of all time. It's a nightmare. Jesus Christ mentioned hell more than he does heaven. I believe this is because he knows the severity and the threat of hell on every human being. Jesus came and obediently died on the cross for the sins of all the world. Every individual has their sins paid. Yet should they die without trusting, they would spend eternity in this fire. He was on a mission to pull people from the fire. The passion that Jesus had to die on the cross for sinners to avoid hell is the passion driving me to tell others about it. We see a clear and disturbing account of hell in Luke 16. The rich man's body was buried in the ground, but his soul lived on in hell. And in hell he lift up his eyes, been in torment, Luke 16, 23. The rich man was clearly in everlasting torment. He was able to move, perceive torment, and know where he was, Begging for a drop of cool water, he calls out to Abraham and Lazarus. The response is chilling. A gulf separates them for all eternity. Even if they desire to assist him, they could not. He would burn and burn for all eternity. Think on this. He is still there to this very moment. Same amount of torture. Same amount of regrets. Same level of insanity. Forever. The Greek word aeon is translated to eternity or everlasting and also means perpetual and without end. We see the use of this word over seven times to describe hell. Not even the cruelest of torture known today can measure up to the infinite torture in hell. Then shall he say also to them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed into everlasting fire. Prepare for the devil and his angels. Matthew twenty five forty one. Hell was not even created with the intentions of lost souls. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. Revelation chapter 20 and verse 10. When a person dies, and they have not trusted Christ, they are destined to spend eternity in hell. It's irreversible, and it can be avoided. It pains me to think of the people who have turned me down when I have tried to share the gospel. They very might well stand before God and be asked why they didn't listen. At the time, they might have all the right answers, but it will be too late. God will look at them and their sin, then cast them into eternal separation forever. This is my motivation to preach the gospel, because people are headed toward everlasting life or everlasting punishment. Don't you think our college has come along pretty good? If they don't have a vision, they won't make it. They have to have not just a vision of heaven, but a vision of hell. Christ gives us that vision. You've already got your Bible open to Luke chapter 16, right? I told you to turn there a while ago. You are obedient, aren't you? Luke chapter 16, I just want to share with you a couple thoughts here. In verse 19... Understanding, yes, there was a, a rich man. These are two real people, two lifestyles. One man rich, one man poor. One man had too much and one man had too little. God didn't stop the rich man from being rich. He didn't stop the poor man from being poor. Both lived and both died. One man died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The other man died, his body was buried, and in hell he lift up his eyes, been in torment, and seeth Abraham afar off and cried unto him, and says, Send Lazarus that he may come and dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. I had a Jehovah's Witnesses one time told me, he says, uh, That's just a picture. 
It's not real. It's just a picture. I says, a picture of what? It's just a picture of what? Christ is telling this story. What's it a picture of? Life after death. Two places. Names the people. Names Abraham. Says what he wanted. And says, send him that he may talk to my five brothers. He's got, got five brothers. Lest they come to this place of torment. See what he says over there. In verse 28, for I have five brothers that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. If there is no such place, Jesus Christ was out of place, putting that in his word, without a footnote saying, this isn't a real place. I'm just joking. This is only a picture of something, but I don't know what it is. No. Christ came into the world to save sinners. Save us from what? This. If it's just from annihilation, who cares? If you're annihilated, you're annihilated. You do that every night you go to sleep. You don't know you're around. You're out. You're gone. If you never woke up, it wouldn't bother you if there isn't anything. But lo and behold, every morning we seem to wake up again. Sometimes we wake up and we don't want to wake up. Sometimes you have to get up and you don't want to get up. I told my body this morning, I said, body, get out of the bed. He says, I will not. I said, you got to go. He said, I'm not going anywhere. So I have to sometimes force myself to do what I don't want to do. But you see, he talked about it. Looked in Matthew chapter 25 very quickly. Matthew in chapter 25. Matthew chapter 25, and you'll notice that Jesus Christ is coming back to the earth again. Look in verse 31. He's coming. Verse 31, in verse of Matthew 25, he says, When the Son of Man shall come in his glory. And this is when every eye will see him. He'll come, and the lightning will be as far as the east is to the west. And this is at the end of the tribulation period. Now, we've already been taken out seven years before. But at the end of the tribulation period, he's coming back, and we're coming back with him. And he says, then shall he set upon the throne of his glory. He's going to set up his kingdom upon this earth. You see, he came the first time to do this, but they rejected him and crucified him. So the kingdom was postponed because the king was rejected and killed. But he's coming back. He came the first time like a lamb to be led to the slaughter. The next time he's coming back as the lion of the tribe of Judah. And he's going to rule with a rod of iron. You've never seen a man until you meet Jesus Christ. He's a man's man. There is no man like Jesus Christ. No man's ever lived like this man or spoke like this man. This man was the Son of God. And he says he's coming back. Look what he says in verse 41. And he's going to divide the people that are left here at this time after the tribulation period. And it says in verse 41, Then shall he say unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire. You see, they're cursed. You see, everyone who has sinned in this world is under a curse. We are all under the wrath of God. But he that believeth on him is not condemned. But he that believeth not is condemned already. He that believeth on him hath everlasting life. But he that believeth not is under the wrath of God. It abides upon him. So we're all cursed. But Christ came and died, took all of the sins of the world and paid for it, and only those who believe on him are removed from the curse of everlasting fire. So he says here, you cursed into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. So it's not just going to be the devil in hell, not just going to be his angels in hell, but also the people that reject Christ. Now you tell me, is that serious or not? that important or not? 
You may love your mother and your father, but you know your mother and dad, if they haven't trusted Christ as Savior, all the love in the world won't keep them out. They're going to hell. Your brothers and sisters, if they haven't trusted Christ as Savior, they're lost. I'm not talking about do they go to church. I'm not talking about if they're religious. Have they trusted Christ as their Savior? Well, they go to church all the time. That has nothing to do with anything. No man goes to heaven because he goes to church. You don't have to go to this church to go to heaven. You don't have to be water baptized to go to heaven. You don't have to give money to go to heaven. You don't have to change your life to go to heaven. You don't have to stop anything, join anything, promise anything. Salvation is a gift. And all you have to do is receive it. Believe it. It's something that everybody can do, whether you're a little child or whether you're old, and everybody in between, all you have to do is believe it. And if you'll believe it, God will put that payment he made to your account. You go to heaven on what he did for you. Just a while ago, James sung that song, Paid in Full. Jesus is the living proof of payment. That all the sins have been paid. He came back from the dead. And the scars in his hand simply says paid in full. You see I have a payment for my sins. Christ was my payment. He died for me in my place. That's why I can't go to hell today or tomorrow. I can never go to hell. Because you see I have a receipt for my sins. I've already paid for mine. I did it in Christ because, you see, he did it for me. And I'm going to heaven because of what Christ did for me. So even while you're sitting here right now, you don't have to join anything, stop anything. You don't have to stand up or come forward, sign a card. All you have to do is in your own mind. That makes sense to me. I'm going to trust Christ as my Savior. I believe he did it for me too because he did it for the world. But only those who believe does God give them eternal life. He says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever, anybody in the world, believeth in him. You can do this. You can handle that. That's something you can do. Now, if he asks you to stand on your head and spit wooden nickels, you may have a problem. If he asks you to live a perfect life, you've got a problem. But he only asks you, would you believe that I did it for you? And I'll put it this way to you, which I like doing. Did you know that Jesus loved you so much that he would rather die than live without you? Think about that. He loves you so much he'd rather die than live without you. You are that precious to him. You see, if you reject Christ, you are rejecting his love. That's God's way of showing you how much he loved you. God's love was manifested that you and I would understand that Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. While we were yet sinners. Look what he says here in verse 46. Look in verse 46. And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. See, there's two groups of people. There's only two groups of people in this whole world. The saints and the ain'ts. The haves and the have-nots. Those that believe and those that don't believe. There's only two kinds of people. A lot of time I talk to people and they'll say, well, I'm, I'm Catholic or I'm Baptist or I'm a foot-washing Aborigine, but whatever they are. I say, you know, there's only two kinds of people. The kind that's going to heaven, the kind that ain't. Which kind are you? Are you the kind that's going to heaven? I did a funeral yesterday. we will do a memorial next Sunday. But if I was going to do your funeral, where do I tell people you went? Don't you think your loved ones ought to know? They would want to know that if you trusted Christ as your Savior, and you say, I know I'm going to heaven when I die, but you never tell anybody. You never tell anybody. You just keep it all inside. That's good for you. But it's torture for others who don't know and love you so much. After I trusted Christ as my Savior, I thought the whole world needs to hear this. I thought they just couldn't wait till I got to them. Well, not exactly. 
But little by little, I began to get some of my family saved. I wanted my family. I didn't care about so much the world. I just wanted to get my family saved. And they, little by little, they come to know the Lord. And I'm so glad. I'm so glad. Two places. Heaven. Hell. Let's pray, shall we? Hold, hold, look up here just a second. Let me just show you this right quick. After all of that, how could I dare forget this? I want you to watch me real close. At no time will this hand ever leave my wrist. Would you watch it real close? This is you and me. This is sin. We all have sin upon us. God says he loves us. I done told you that. He loves you. But because of sin, God has to punish you because of the sin. Because you did it. I did it. We deserve to go to hell to be separated from God because we don't deserve to go to heaven. You have to be perfect to deserve to go to heaven. Nobody deserves it. So nobody can earn their way to heaven. But God still loves us. But he said he wants us to go to heaven, but we'd have to be perfect, no sin, and nobody is. We're all in the same boat. We're all sinners. And the Bible says you cannot save yourself. And many people think they save themselves by trying to get rid of their sin, you know. You can't get rid of it. It's on the inside of you. Well, you've got to turn over a new leaf. Well, you can turn it any way you want to. Sin's on the inside of you. You have, you have a root problem. The fruit is just a re revealing the, the root problem. We're all sinners. This hand represents Jesus Christ. He's the Lord God in the flesh. You've heard this. He came into the world. Why? Because he loves us. He hates our sin because our sin separates us from God. We can't go to be with the Lord because of sin. So what did Christ do? He took all of the sin of all of the world, paid for it on the cross, came back from the dead. You've heard that. Well, if he came back from the dead, what do I have to, what does that do for me? He said, if I believe he did it for me, he put the payment he made to my account. I go to heaven on what Christ did. And yet there's people trying to earn their way to heaven by all those good deeds they do. And they reject this as though it has no value to it at all. Your good deeds can't even help you get to heaven. I'm going to heaven because Christ paid for my sins in full. And I believe he did it for me and he gives me eternal life. I go to heaven on what Christ did. Isn't that good news? So yes, we're sinners in the hands of an angry God. But if you trust Christ as your Savior, you're saints in the hands of a loving God. Let's pray, shall we? Every head bowed and every eye closed, no one looking around. If you're here this morning and you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, would you trust Him right now? In the quietness of this moment, just talk to the Lord. Say, Lord, I don't understand it all. My friend, you may have a lot of questions, a lot of doubts. I'm not trying to get you to change your church. I'm not trying to get you to join anything, give anything. I'm just saying, right where you are, would you accept Christ as your Savior? Would you trust Him to take you to heaven when you die? He said, if you would trust Him, He would save you, give you eternal life. And you can know that you have eternal life. Know that you're going to heaven when you die. It's the best news in all the world. No tricks to it. No gimmicks. But I'd like to know if what I said made sense. I do this with heads bowed, nice close, so that nobody will be embarrassed. I'm not going to ask anything from you. I just want to know, did what I say, did it make sense? I'm going to ask you in just a moment to raise your hand. Raising your hand does not save you. It just lets me know that what I said made sense to you. And I'd like to have prayer for you in closing. Is there anyone at all say, yes, preacher, that made sense to me. I want to be certain of going to heaven. And I want you to pray for me. Would you slip your hand up very quickly and put it right back down? Yes, God bless you, sir. Anyone else, just slip it up real quick, put it right back down. Anyone else before we close? I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to point you out. I'm not going to ask you to do anything else. I'm not going to pin you against the wall or anything like that. Just, I just want to know what I said made sense. You said, yes, preacher, that made sense, and I will. God bless you, ma'am. Anyone else? So wait just a second. This is so important. Yes, God bless you, sir. Anyone else? I know you're thinking. I know you're thinking. I want you to have eternal life. I want you to go to heaven. It's the most important. That's why Christ came. It's his way of showing you how much he loves you. To save you from a place called hell. Anyone else before we close? Our Father, we thank you so much for these that indicated by an uplifted hand that they would trust Christ as their Savior today. 
By doing so, you guarantee them eternal life. So when they get up to leave, they can say, I'm going to heaven. Because today I trusted Christ as my Savior. He paid for all of my sins. I don't have any sins to pay for. That's why I can't go to hell. And he said he'd never cast you out and never lose you. Lord, thank you so much for each one of these. In Christ's name we pray.